Sanjeev Vikjandani joining us now. Sanjeev, good to have you with us. Uh, you know, we've been wanting to talk through a whole host of things with you. And, um, uh, you know, while we have, of course, been keeping track of uh, developments at Nokri, 99 Acres, uh, Jeevan Sathi, etc. What's the, what's the next big trend that you see, Sanjeev? From your vantage point as a big investor, someone who's also seen, you know, high valuations in the likes of a Zomato and see it go from strength to strength. What would you pinpoint as the next big trend going forward? Uh, what we are seeing right now is, um, you know, while there is abundance of capital, there is also scarcity of capital uh, in uh, the internet world, in the startup world, in the private internet space. Uh, so it's a bit of a paradox. So if you're one of the chosen few, right, uh, who's been identified as a winner, you will have abundance of capital. There'll be lots and lots of investors pounding your door. Uh, and we are seeing that in Zomato and we're seeing that in Policy Bazaar. But if you are not among the chosen few and uh, you have scaled and are still burning money, which many companies are, then uh, you could have a challenge, uh, you know, uh, where you may be under stress. Uh, and we are seeing that in several companies, uh, you know, and some of the stuff is emerging, some will emerge going forward. Early stage money is still available, um, you know, reasonably uh, easily, but the cut comes in series A, B, and C. That, you know, you can get your seed round, but can you get your series A? You got your series A, but can you get a series B? And, you know, companies could earlier raise money on promise. Uh, now investors are saying, yeah, you promised last time, what's been the delivery since then? Uh, a lot more uh, questions are being asked uh, as compared to earlier. So investors are a little discerning. I hear you, Sanjeev. Does that mean then that perhaps money is more concentrated, like you're saying, where there's delivery or where businesses, existing businesses are showing growth as opposed to newer ideas? Uh, there has been, you know, natural synergy or organic growth in the likes of EdTech, for example, on the back of uh, uh, the kind of scenario we saw evolve during the last few months. But going forward, where do you see the disruption, if any? Well, I think EdTech is um, getting a lot of traction, um, and that traction it's getting for investors is based on the fact that EdTech is being consumed more by consumers. So there's real performance. Now, there may not be profit, there may be some revenue, but not profit, uh, and that's fine. Hopefully, profit will come sometime in the future. That's what the investors are betting on. Uh, the early stage money, like I said, new ideas uh, are still getting funded, but early stage companies don't consume that much capital. No, the, the big capital, if you look at the last... Uh, uh, you know, maybe five, six, seven, eight years, uh, the big capital in tech startups went into not more than maybe 60% of the capital, went, or maybe 70% of the capital went into maybe a dozen companies, be it a flip card, be it a, you know, a few others. So if you look at concentration of capital, it is around the big companies uh, that are, you know, need the money, that are doing well, and which investors believe are the winners. Sure. Sanjeev, I was just going through your notes. Uh, help our viewers understand what exactly is flipping because from what I go through, it seems like it's a matter of, uh, you know, strategic significance when it comes to India Inc. It is a matter of strategic significance. Uh, I think, you know, look, flipping to help us all understand is the, taking, is the act of taking an Indian company, uh, floating a company overseas, doing a, a share swap and making the Indian company a uh, 100% subsidiary of the overseas company. Now the business is still in India, the business has been done the same way, the product has been developed in India by Indians in the Indian offices. The sales are in India, uh, revenues from India, but the wealth creation is happening outside, right? Uh, this is one step above, you know, uh, you know it's, it's one thing to get foreign investment into an Indian company, we love that. We are all for foreign investors, we need foreign capital especially in, 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 in risk capital. Uh, but the, the way flipping is happening on a large scale basis right now, you know, I think uh, possibly uh, it will create huge issues for us in the future as a nation. So I'm, I'm, flipping is problematic, according to me. So how many companies have flipped, quote unquote, in the last one year or since the breakout of the pandemic? Well, I haven't done last six months analysis, but um, over the last five to seven years, um, I reckon I've not had an enumeration, um, you know, and maybe someone should do it. Between 500 to 1,000 companies have flipped. And understand one thing, only our best startups flip. 
because they are the ones who are wooed by overseas investors who are nudging them to flip. Okay. Uh, now, if 500 have flipped, and uh, like I've said in my, in my earlier note, um, and say 2% become as successful as Nokri, and 0.5% become as successful as Infosys, right? That's a future loss of 17 lakh crore rupees in market cap, uh, you know, as per today's stock market prices. Now, you know, in the early 80s, um, HCL and Infosys were startups. Now, imagine if they'd chosen to flip at that stage. We would not see the future of the IT industry and the and capital markets the way we see it today. We would not see, you know, uh, this kind of market caps happening in India today. And, and that is of some concern. I think it should be of some concern. It's of strategic significance. Uh, you know, a lot of our future value creation uh, will happen from the startups that are flipping. So you have income from India and in India, but you have wealth from uh, being parked overseas, all of it. Uh, you know, there's no, uh, there's no resident shareholder in the Indian company. Mr. Bikchandani, good morning. Nikunj Dalmia also joining. It's so nice to connect with you. Hope's all well. Uh, so take the to just to take the point forward. The reason why some would argue that the startup world is getting capital and this is global capital is because startups are loss making. Very few make money for the first three to five years. And the law in India is that if you're a loss making company, you cannot go public. You gave the example of Infosys and other IT companies, but the reason why they were able to go public is because at least they were making profits, and that's not the that's not the scenario right now. Well, I believe it's got a little easier, uh, although I get to study the regulation in depth. Uh, but but you see, um, a most startups will not go public, right? If you look at tech startups that have gone public, internet startups that have gone public uh, out of India in the last twenty years, you know, there's Info Edge, there's Make My Trip, there's Matrimony, there's India Mart, uh, there's Affid. That's five. There's just dial six. Uh, you know, you're talking about six startups in the last uh, 20 years have gone public. Uh, it's not that many. Most have trade sales, most have strategic sales. The point is that you have, you know, so, so I, and secondly, if the, if, if it's bureaucracy that is driving this, then obviously rules of us must change. So I'm not saying ban flipping. I'm saying create conditions where flipping does not happen. So that's for your package of incentives and disincentives, both. Remember, you're losing data, you're losing IP, uh, and you're losing uh, shareholding ownership as a nation. And that's has not a good situation. Has Indian government done the right thing by banning Chinese? Has Indian government done the right thing by banning the Chinese apps? Because ultimately, it's our data which was going to the Chinese. So, uh, look. But in the beginning, uh, when, when uh, there was a restriction on Chinese investments and uh, Chinese apps were banned, uh, I was apprehensive, right? But the way it's panned out, uh, it hasn't made much of a difference. So in hindsight, uh, you know, it's been all right. I'm going to now perhaps request you to pour in your experience. You incubated Nokri.com, you understand the importance of online job portal 20 years before that time nobody saw it you were able to invest in zomato a pure bet on how the dining habits would change policy bazaar a cluttered bfsi space where policy bazaar gave you one stop shop of best policy to buy how are you looking at investing into future which are the two or three habits which to your mind are going to be big scalable habits and business opportunities for an investor like yours don't invest top down. We don't do macro analysis and say this sector, this trend, this habit, and therefore now let's find a startup. Uh, we simply meet hundreds of startups every month, maybe, you know, and we figure out what's bubbling through. And if an idea looks interesting, team looks good, getting early stage traction, showing uh, natural traction, uh, solving an unsolved problem, uh, we back it with a small sum of money. And then over time, if it does well, we back it with more and more money. And yes, sometimes we succeed, sometimes we fail. But, you know, so Zamato and uh, Policy Bazaar have been two uh, of our investments which are regarded as great successes. 
uh, we have other promising companies, but they're earlier stage. Let's see how many make it and we continue to invest. So it's really a bottom up approach, not a top down. So for example, we've invested in this company called Shop Kinana. Now Shop Kinana is counterintuitive. In a world of organized retail, in a world of online retail, these guys are taking a bet that they can help the very tiny Kirana store, the underserviced Kirana store, underserviced by, 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 by distributors and by big companies. They can help them become more efficient and profitable by doing the last mile distribution to them on the same day, on the same day or next day basis. And in tier two India. And it's showing good traction. So, you know, it's counterintuitive. It, it's, a, it's a small bet we've taken. It looks like it could be all right. Uh, let's see. If I speak to the existing shareholders of InfoEdge, 50% tell me they are buying it for your current businesses, which is Nokri.com, Jeevan Sathi, 99 acres. Other 50% tell me they are buying it because InfoEdge has actually incubated a lot of businesses. So next couple of years, what will be bigger for you? The incubated businesses or the current organic businesses? Look, uh, we are an operating company. We have 4,500 employees. Of them, about six or seven work in uh, external investments, right? The remaining, the vast majority, and the organization focus is to run our current businesses. And quite honestly, if we weren't making a profit in Nokri the way we are, and the way we have in the past, and the way we hope to in the future, uh, none of the other stuff would exist. So Nokri is the foundation on which everything else uh, has, has been done. And it will, uh, so for operating businesses will remain our main focus. Uh, we will also invest. Okay. When you look at your operating businesses, and Hitesh and we interact a lot, but in your understanding, has the pandemic made these operating businesses much more bigger? And, you know, for, let's say, even Policy Bazaar or even Jeevan Sathi, do you think this pandemic, in a sense, has completely changed the demand dimensions of growth and importance and relevance? Um. Well, it's a mixed bag, right? It's different, different businesses. So we saw Jeevan Sathi growing nicely uh, right through the lockdown. Nokri on the other hand was badly impacted because uh, people were simply not hiring. Or they are hiring fewer people, right? Uh, for the first few months. Uh, then um, 99 acres were hit really badly because for the first three, four months, nobody was buying real estate. Okay, But now things are coming back. Um, but yes, it has taught us a lot. If you'd asked me in February or January, hey, do you think uh, you can uh, work from home? And I would have laughed at him and said, no way. We are a you know, line of sight company. We work in teams, we work together. We work, we work from office. Uh, we actually went to work from home about 10 days before the lockdown, before the government even began to talk about work from home because we figured that it's probably coming. Uh, and we had, you know, you know uh, we, have, we had people uh, in, you know, I, we, had, we had moved one or two people from our CSR team uh, the moment the videos began to come from Wuhan and it looked like it might spread all over the world, we put two people on CSR things and just track this thing. I want daily MIS. So we were getting daily MISs on the spread of you know COVID around the world. And when the first case happened, uh, which was reported widely, uh, of that the Air India flight that came from Italy and there was a passenger and he uh, was identified as the first real case who spread it to people in Delhi and then Agra. Uh, so one of our senior, my senior colleague's uh, spouse was cabin crew on that flight. And uh, she had been told to go to quarantine. So he told us that he was going to quarantine. And that's when he first figured, okay, it's reaching here. And so we went into work from home two weeks before the lockdown, 10 days before lockdown. And I think uh, we were, I've been pleasantly surprised by, by work from home. Uh, I had thought it'd be very hard, but it's been fairly seamless. And we are able to do almost everything from home and do it pretty effectively. Now, that does not mean we'll not go back to office when um, the pandemic receives, when COVID receives. We obviously will. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have been pleasantly surprised. Uh, you know, our salespeople were doing two, three sales calls a day, uh, you know, on the, prior to the, the pandemic. Now, on video, they're able to do 10 or 12 sales calls a day. Uh, not that sales are growing because it's a tough environment, but uh, it's, uh, the activity is a lot higher. Last uh, decade, in a sense, has been dominated by the U.S. tech giants in terms of advertising, 
in terms of uh, cloud growth, in terms of our daily life and the data sharing. How do you see the dominance of the top four, five US firms moving in this decade? Are we in for a big breakdown there? Are we in for very strict laws for data sharing? What will happen to that end of the economy or that part of the world? That's, um, you know, that's just kind of hard to predict. I mean, there's a lot of activity and talk there. I think governments and public are concerned about uh, increasing concentration of power and, and data, uh, you know, um, with a few companies. Uh, so these companies, I think, uh, if they want to stave off restrictive regulation, will have to uh, openly declare uh, policies uh, which demonstrate that they're going to be responsible, right? Otherwise, there will be increasing public pressure uh, to put restrictions on them. And beyond the point, that pressure may be hard to resist. How do you see trends shaping up in the healthcare stroke, the startup space? Because that's where all countries would be spending more, whether it is on the government side or also on the public side, whether it is consolidation of, uh, uh, you know, the pharmacy market or more innovation happening in terms of, uh, you know, uh, telemedicine. How excited are you about investing in that space? Because that's one space where you don't have a large presence. We, we've got two or three things. So uh, a significant chunk of policy with our sales happens from health insurance policies. Uh, we've invested in a company called Medcords in out of Kota, of all places, uh, you know, uh, which is into rural healthcare, right? Uh, and we've invested in a sort of a, a pharma, an, an online pharma distribution company uh, called Bombay. These are small experiments. We are studying it. See, up until now, we have seen a lot of healthcare startups, uh, and we weren't convinced how many of them would would would, would make a profit, right? Uh, and we still like to apply that prism that we should know at least how you could make a profit, and when you could make a profit, whether or not you make one, you know, remains to be seen. Uh, but 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 can you make a profit? Uh, and there, I think we have been a bit challenged in the healthcare space to, for maybe it's our lack of understanding as to how many of these companies will make a profit. How many startups do you always examine for investing and how many startups do you actually say no to? Because your list uh, of no is far greater than the list of yes. Yes, of course. Uh, so we've invested about 30 to 35 startups in the last 13 years. Uh, we must have seen about seven to 10,000, right? Uh, now, we've had a very long list of declines, which, uh, you know, if we had invested, we might have made a lot of money. So that happens. So the issue is not what you say no to. The issue is the ones you say yes to, are they doing well? So if you're slightly conservative and you don't spray and pray, you will identify good ones and only back them. But of course, you make mistakes. Three things which you always look at. Three things which you always look at before saying yes to a startup. What are the three things which are part of your checklist? I would say three or four things. First is, look, is there evidence of natural traction? Is it solving an unsolved problem? Is it getting traffic without uh, advertising? Is that traffic growing? Zomato got that, Nokri got that, right? Uh, two is quality of team. Are they committed? Are they good? Uh, you know, will they stay the course, uh, right? Uh, three is, is this business, does it have a moat? Can it build a moat? Does it building IP? Is there network effect? Uh, okay. And four is competitive environment. Is there an established company is going up against? If it is, there's a problem. Uh, you know, uh, these four things are very important. And of course, there are 20 other things, but these four things are really important. I have two more questions before we allow you to escape because it's a rarity for us to get you on uh, ET now. How do you see the platform business moving? Because that's where everybody wants to be. The network effects, as we famously say. Reliance is trying to create a platform. Amazon has created a platform. Microsoft has a platform. Where do you see that business moving? So I think people have to identify, uh, you know, in what area they want to build a platform. And if there's already an existing platform that is established, it gets very hard for you to beat that, unless you're doing something differentiated in a relevant manner. So it's a good idea to build platforms now, you know, in spaces where there aren't too many. Right? 
Uh, and uh, yes, I mean the platform economy is can be highly profitable, but uh, all the profits typically go to number one. Uh, platforms usually are a winner take all market. Do you see disruptive trends in the unorganized market? Because the common pitch is that India is a very large unorganized market. The platform players and organized players will eat into all. The Kirana guys will find it difficult to struggle. The Nukar chemist shop will not survive. Do you think we are staring at very large disruptive trends in the unorganized space because of technology, digital and platforms? I haven't seen too many unorganized shopkeepers Kirana stores go out of business because Amazon came in or Flipkart came in or organized retail came in, right? I mean, 1.3 billion and growing, uh, it's a large economy. Uh, the, the unorganized sector guy also adds value to his set of customers in his micro geography, right? Uh, so as long as he can keep adding value and as long as he adopts digital. So for example, this Dukan tech that's come up. There are five or six companies offering Dukan apps, including one that we've invested in, DotPay, right? Now, as they are adopted by more and more SMEs, SMBs, uh, small shopkeepers, uh, they will find, I mean, they, they are finding tools by which they can compete with uh, with online and with organized retail. So I think, uh, you know, it's I, I, I see an evolution in India. Uh, I don't see a revolution. A common friend of ours, Saurabh Mukherjee, in his book has made your mention, a mention on your journey. How after graduating from a business school, you decided to start your own company and not take an MNC job. Today, InfoH stock has created tremendous amount of shareholder value. It is at 4,000 plus. When you look back and analyze your journey of an entrepreneur, what has been the happiest moment? What has been the moment of regret? Well, I think the happiest moment is when a customer tells you that, look, he benefited from your product. Uh, a happiest moment is when an employee or a long-standing employee tells you that, listen, you know, I love working here, right? Uh, a happy moment is when uh, investors tell you, listen, so I'll tell you, uh, my happiest moment uh, with an investor was when it was a, you know, blue chip, US-based uh, shareholder, New York-based, who said, listen, you're getting a 25% premium on your stock price because of corporate governance. Uh, you are so well governed that uh, you know we, we you know people just buy your stock and you know you go to sleep uh, and they don't mind paying a higher price because you have built a reputation for corporate governance and I think uh, that makes us proud. The market cap of Infoage is fifty six thousand crore, nearing nearing ten billion dollars. What's next now? for InfoEdge as a company. What happens in the market is a function of market dynamics. But in this decade, what is your vision for InfoEdge? I think, look, uh, we run the business. And we, you know, market cap goes up, it goes down. Uh, you know, we don't decide that. Uh, you know, we don't influence that, except to the extent that we run the business well or we run it badly. Uh, so we focus on the business. Now, in the business, we see hopefully an acquisition or two, uh, which is why we did our QIP. In the business, we see our four verticals growing and we uh, we, we acquiring leadership wherever we don't have it and strengthening leadership wherever we do have it. Uh, we expect our other verticals to turn profitable, uh, not just Nokri. Uh, we expect to continue to invest in other startups. We expect our current portfolio of startups to uh, uh, grow and do well. So in the medium to long run, we uh, hope and expect that we will own substantially or wholly maybe four or five uh, internet businesses uh, that are very valuable with uh, a pipeline of more building up. When I say very valuable, I mean in uh, market caps, uh, upwards of a billion or a couple of billion dollars each. Really appreciate your time and certainly hope to see much more of you going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you.